Happy Father's Day. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to John chapter 20. We are in our spiritual revival message series. If I had another announcement to give, I don't remember what it was, and so hope you're listening to my wife. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, if you will reset my clock for me, I would appreciate it, and let us do our thing. We're in our series, Spiritual Revival, and um, we're, we're seeing God do pretty exciting things in our midst. Amen? There's, there, there's seats on the front. If you want to be within the wave, the crashing of the wave, you can move ha, forward, be near Lillian and get, yeah, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want to ask you a question. Is it the church if the Holy Ghost isn't there? Is it the body if the Spirit of Christ isn't in it? That, that's my question I want you to think about. This morning, and uh, as we as we as we turn to John chapter twenty, I want to kind of catch us up, kind of uh, kind of give the backstory, if I could. In John chapter twenty, um, if you've read the Bible, uh, Jesus is in it. He's the Son of God, and uh, he was sacrificed on the third day. Excuse me, he was crucified, and on the third day he rose from the dead. But they didn't understand that that's what was going to happen, even though he told them so many times. Uh, he kept telling them, and they couldn't understand it. And uh, I, I think sometimes we, we, give, we, give, we give them a bad rap, and we make them think like they didn't have faith, and we make them think like they weren't believing, and they weren't... It, it kind of, you know, from their perspective, it looked like, you know, God multiplied at some point. And, you know, after a couple thousand years of Judaism, where they have one God, and they didn't understand the Godhead, even though all throughout the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, God is, refers to himself in the plural, uh, is still, you didn't quite get that until Jesus showed up on the scene, and they're like, wait a minute, we have one God, now you're saying we have, there's two gods that are one? That doesn't make any sense at all. And later on, they would find out even greater, there is actually three in one. I, I hope he doesn't come again and mess up our scriptures. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it like that. But um, the three in one God was there. And, uh, and, and so after the crucifixion, they went back to the, uh, to the grave. Uh, they were going to leave some flowers, you know, make everything smell nice. But the, the grave was open, of course, and, and it was empty. And uh, in ver- here's where we find ourselves in John chapter 20, verse 11. It says, Mary Magdalene uh, was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, wow, wow, hmm, hey. As she wept, she stood and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting, one as the head one, and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Say amen to the reading. I have found that you will find what you're looking for. I have found that you will find what you're looking for. If you read the story, before Mary Magdalene got there, there, a couple other disciples got there and looked into the tomb, and all they saw were dirty laundry. Mary Magdalene looked in the same tomb and saw angels. I have found that you will find what you're looking for. If you're looking for dirty laundry, you'll find it. If you're looking for angels, you will find it. And so as we are in our, 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 our spiritual revival series, I hope that you're looking for the movement of the Spirit of God. I hope you're looking for your own personal Pentecost because after, after this happened, after they found out that Jesus had been risen from the dead, she ran, of course, and uh, told the disciples about it. And uh, they went and waited, and, and the Spirit of God fell. And the title of my message today is, Someone Stole the Body. Somebody Stole the Body. Now, on the day of Pentecost is when the church was born, but that's not actually the beginning of the story, as we've been saying over and over again. The beginning of the story started back in the garden. And uh, in the garden, there was creation. Got my little cute graphic we've been looking at. Creation, 
and then the fall of man in the garden, and then God began the redemption with the law and then perfected the redemption on the cross, and we're in a season of restoration. And this whole thing started in a garden with Adam and Eve and God. And they didn't become children of God until they received the breath of God in them. And they received this breath of God and came to life. And God told them to tend the garden. Now, we tend to think that in the garden, they were just sitting around chilling, eating grapes. But God actually gave them work to do in the garden. And that's why they needed a Sabbath. So they worked in the garden. They tended the garden. That was man's original charge on the earth was to take care of the earth, to multiply, uh, to tend the earth, and, and to subdue it. And so as we talk about Adam and Eve was in the garden, and then they fell, and there's redemption, and there's restoration, we, we have to ask the question, what is it that God is restoring? Are, are you following with me here? What is it that God is restoring? If we're in this season of restoration, and we're in the time frame of God restoring, we have to ask, what is He restoring? Because that's where we're going. Does that make sense? And everything He's doing points towards what He is restoring. And, and, and let me say in short order, He is restoring the breath of God in the earth. This is what is restoring, the breath of God in the earth. We read earlier in John chapter 20 about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and this is a central moment in human history. Jesus walked the earth. I want you to think about this. Walked the earth for, for 30 years. And then he received the Spirit of God upon him. And then he lived for about another three years or so before he was sacrificed. Fully 30% of the Gospels... A third of the Gospels deal entirely with the last week, the last days, even the last hours of the life of Jesus. A third of all that was written, of all that could be written, of what God did on the earth as man, of every act that he did and every miracle that he did and every teaching that he did and every, every, everything that that stumped the disciples and every, every lesson, every, every, every life story, every miracle, every teaching that he did, out of everything that happened to him, a full third of that story that was written about him was one week. In some Gospels, it was just the last hours. And so we're left to wonder, why did they focus so much in the Gospels on, on, on one week why, why, with all this information leading up to the, the, the passion, which is that, that short period of time that started in his triumphal entry and, and of course, culminated on, on the cross with his crucifixion, all these accounts of his last hours and his sacrifice, why so little in the Gospels is written about what happened afterwards? And this begs the question, how are we to live after the cross? How are we to live after the cross? And it would seem almost that the Gospels are written in a way that is supposed to be a mystery. That the Gospels were written in a way that we can't really know. And we just get the teachings of Paul and the teachings of, of Peter. And, and we are just to take those and maybe try to apply those because we don't really know how to live after the cross. Well, let, let me tell you this. We see a prophetic picture uh, in the scripture that we looked at in, in, in John chapter 20. If we go to look at it in John chapter 20, if we were to turn back just very quickly, in verse 14, he says, somebody's kids having a good time. He says, are, are you tracking with me? Are we okay so far? Okay, good. When Mary Magdalene had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the, what's that say? Gardener. Now, this whole story started in a garden. Mary Magdalene sees the risen Christ, supposing him to be a one who tends the garden. See, Jesus come back to restore the garden on the earth through us. And he is the master gardener directing us to restore this garden on the earth. This, this is what we're restoring. This is what's re being restored. And this is what our role on the earth is. Jesus shows up to tend 
the garden that he had been given by his father. The church keeps looking at it as two stories. We keep looking at it as there is all this teaching up till Jesus, and then after that, we just got to kind of figure out how to work this thing out based on some principles from Paul. But that's not how it was originally written. Actually, there's one story. There's one beautiful story. There's one great and wonderful, beautiful story of creation that fell in God trying to restore the creation to himself. And there was a man named uh, Luke who, who wrote about this story. And in, 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 in Luke and Acts originally were one story. Originally, Luke and Acts were written together. They were carried together. They were presented together. They were studied together. They were carried around together. It was one story, Luke and Acts. But at some point, the fathers wanted to get the Gospels together, and they took Luke away from Acts, and they put it with the other three Gospels. And there's the three synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then there is John. And everybody tells people, when you first meet Christ, you should read the book of John for some reason. But if you look at the beginning of the book of Luke, it was written to explain why Jesus came, why he died, and then the book of Acts shows how they lived after he was resurrected. It was clearly written to teach people who were not Jews what this whole Jesus thing is about, why he needed to do what he did, and what we can expect after he was raised from the dead. Does that make sense? And so part of what we're doing as a church is we're reconstructing what had been deconstructed in years past. And we want to stand on what the church fathers did. We stand on the, on the creeds and the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and we have 2,000 years of really intelligent people studying the Scriptures, studying God, praying, and seeing what God was speaking to the earth and, and what these things mean and who God is. And we don't throw that out easily. We don't just say, well, I know for 2,000 years, if I could just kind of tread on this, 2,000 years, sexuality had been understood this way very clearly by people. And even for thousands of years before that, then all of a sudden someone gets an idea and says, well, actually, maybe all that is changing. Maybe the last 5,000 years of the God story all of a sudden changed in the 1970s. And I would say we have to tread very lightly before we change 5,000 years of church history. Does, does that make sense? We have to tread very lightly. And, I, and, I, would, and I, would even, I would even say this. I would even say this. We have to be very careful that we believe what we want to believe. We have to tread very carefully when we only believe what we want to believe. Because there's things in the, in the story that I don't want to believe. If I can be honest with you. There's things in the Bible I don't want to believe. I do not want to believe in hell. I don't want to believe in eternal judgment, do you? If you like the idea of eternal judgment, there's a, you have a problem. There is a love problem in your life. I don't want to believe lay down your life to gain it. I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that I can do whatever I want to do and I'll get everything God has for me. I don't want to believe that. If you want to believe that, I, I, you probably aren't defining that correctly. Are, are we on the same page here? We can't just believe the stuff we want to believe. We have to believe what it actually says. Does that make sense? And we've invented lots of things in, 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 in ever since the Enlightenment, really, but really since the 60s and 70s, we're, we're inventing theologies that aren't actually in the Bible. That in, and beyond that, aren't part of historical church beliefs. We want, to, we, want to, we want to track carefully because there's a danger in calling things God that aren't God. We open the door to the enemy. So, so here's what I propose to you. Luke is the story before the resurrection. Acts is how we live after the resurrection. It was all presented as one story. One's supposed to be a great mystery, and Pentecost is the turning point for the church. Pentecost is the turning point for the church. Now, you would say, no, 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 it's a sacrifice of Jesus. Well, sacrifice of Jesus is a turning point for all mankind. Pentecost is, is a turning point in the church, and let me, let me try to explain this. When Jesus walked the earth, he had the fullness of the Spirit. He was taken up into heaven, and then he released the Spirit. Now, the Spirit is on the body. The Spirit is on the body. It was on Jesus when he walked the earth. He went up into heaven, and then he released it to who? The church. He released the Spirit to the church, and the Spirit now rests on the body of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say, in many aspects, somebody stole the body. 
Because we don't see the Spirit landing upon Him. We don't see the Spirit at work upon Him. We don't, we don't see what's called the body to have the life of the body. It was like, in, in, like we read in Samuel, the Word of the Lord was not heard much in those days, and it seemed that the light was almost out. But I'm here to let you know there is a church with the Spirit still on the body. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2. Verse 2 says, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. I find it interesting that he released the Spirit on the church, but he didn't release it on a building, he released it on people. Individually, we are the church collectively. Individually, we are the church collectively, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God breathed into Adam, and he had life. The Spirit landed upon Jesus, and he had power. And it rests on each of us today. And this is the church that was birthed from the side of Jesus. The church became the body and it became official when he filled it with his spirit. Are, are you hearing me? But some people stole the body because we can't see the spirit at work in it. So many churches today stop at John in the Gospels. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They think it's some sort of order that God ordered it in. And then they may skip to Romans, may skip to 1 Peter, may skip to when really the story is Luke acts. Then let's try to apply some of this stuff. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. The modern church strategy today, if, if I could say it, uh, not as accusation because it's really working out well for some people, is, is, is we be the church, but let's leave the Holy Spirit to the back room, small groups. Let's not weird people out because people today are just going to be weirded out by supernatural things. We don't want to freak them out with too much supernatural stuff. Like, Holy Spirit is like that crazy ant you don't want to come to the family reunion, <laughs> right? Like, we have a nice little thing we've planned, and if she comes, people are going to be awkward, and they're not going to come back. But the Holy Spirit is living in the body. People, people today aren't actually freaked out by supernatural. People are, are yearning for supernatural. Yeah. Have you heard of a guy named M. Night Shamla? He's a movie producer, and he's made a whole bunch of movies. He's got a little graphic here. He made a whole bunch of movies, and the guy has made over, gross over a billion dollars with these weird supernatural movies. Have you heard of The Sixth Sense? Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't mind being weird for $293 million. How about you? Yeah. People threw $293 million at weird. The world is not freaked out by the supernatural. The world is not freaked out by the supernatural. And the church owns that. The church owns, like, we, we are the only ones with the real supernatural power of God. And you, and you hear today, everybody's taking, like, the Enneagram, right? We do the Enneagram, and we do ancestry DNA. Why? 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 Because we want to know who we are and where we come from. And you can't get that without Holy Spirit. You can't get that from Holy Spirit. The Enneagram can kind of help you maybe understand how things work and ancestry kind of, but really who you are and where you come from, you do not understand unless you get the Holy Ghost of God at work in your life. This makes sense. Our society is dying to know who they are and where they come from. And we have the story. We have the story. The story comes from God. There's only one... There's, there's one spirit that rests upon the body, and he brings life, and he brings purpose. Jesus said in Acts, excuse me, in John 6.38, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That tells me that Jesus knew where he came from and what his purpose was, who he was and where he was going. He just knew this because he had relationship with the Father. He didn't need a test. He didn't need, uh, he didn't need personality diagnoses. He didn't need to have his genetics tested. He actually had the Spirit of God in him, so he understood what was going on in his life. We, we need more than teaching in the church today, amen? We need more than teaching. We need the presence 
of God by His Spirit. The world needs the presence of God by His Spirit. The, the world needs the body that has the Spirit landing on it and available to the world at large. But I'm here to tell you, somebody has stolen the body and we're taking it back. Amen? In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, we see that they're filled with the Spirit. And every time in, in, the, in, the, in the book of Acts that someone is filled with the Spirit, we see two things happen. We see tongues and we see prophecy, right? Not always at the same time. Sometimes they only prophesied. Sometimes they only spoke in tongues. Sometimes they, they did both. But there's something that happens when the Spirit of God comes upon you and you're able to speak the Word of God all of a sudden. All of a sudden, it's as if the mind of God rests on the inside of you and you can now speak according to God's will. Like all of a sudden, you're empowered to do the God stuff of creating with your voice. All of a sudden, something very supernatural happens that God uses the creative power in your voice. Sometimes he takes it over and does it for you. Sometimes you just, you're just in the spirit and you're talking to somebody and you say something and it comes out of your mouth. You're like, what, where, what was that? And, you're like, and you don't even recognize You just prophesied over your own self. You just prophesied over that situation. You just prophesied over somebody's life. You just spoke something into existence that would not have happened had you not had a willing mouth. Fill with the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? But he didn't just fill us alone. He didn't just say that we're going to be alone in this filling. And this is where the American church and the Western church has jumped the tracks. We start thinking just me and God is enough. And I can have full understanding just me and God because I have the Spirit of God. Let me show you a picture. Have you ever seen a painting like this one? On the day of Pentecost and the tongues of fire fell upon them. You, you, have you, you've seen these pictures, right? And the Spirit of God fell. And the Bible says that there was, there was a fire as a tongue, like a tongue of fire on each one of their heads, right? And they began to prophesy and, and speak in new tongues. You, you, you remember this, right? Yeah. Do you notice that each person had a tongue, right? Yeah. Do you notice anything else? Here's what I would like you to look at in these paintings when you look at them. Nobody can see the fire that's upon their head. You need somebody else to tell you. You need somebody else to tell you what the tongue is upon your head. But here we are in our individualistic Western culture. I know. I got it all on my own. I'll let you know. Here I am. Man with a business card ready to start a ministry. I, I get it so often. We've had it at this church so many times. So many people come in ready to start. And we're just like, yeah, we'll let you know what we see upon your life. And sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse. And that's what we need. Amen. Is that what we need or is that what we need? We need. And I have found more often than not, people see the, instead of people looking for the dirty laundry in my life, they see the angels. Amen. Some people look and they just see a dirty, the empty tomb. Other people look and they see dirty laundry. But those in the spirit look and they see the angels. Amen? Amen. And when this flame lands upon you, let me say it again. Come on. When this flame lands upon you, when this flame lands upon you, when this flame lands upon you, Have any of you prayed for God to show up? Have you prayed? Yeah. Have you prayed for God to show up? Have you, have you done that? Have you ever done, like, God, I need you to show up? Yeah. Has that ever happened? Yeah. Has he shown up? Yeah. You don't want to run away quickly when he shows up, right? Yeah. When this flame lands upon you, I don't want to run through the moment of him showing up. When this flame lands upon you, <clears throat> Kelly, <clears throat> when this flame lands upon you, Robin,
when this flame lands upon you. When this flame lands upon you, it changes who you are. When this flame lands upon you, Vivi, Michael, when this flame lands upon you, wow, you get creative in ways you couldn't get creative before. When this flame lands upon you, you're able to be submissive in ways you could never be submissive before. You're able to be bold in ways you could never be bold before. You could speak for God in ways you've never been able before. This flame changes who you are. Come on. It changes who you are. Come on. It cha- now listen. Listen. We have made the big mistake of assigning this only to church. Now, this doesn't mean that in the middle of your workplace you need to have the flame land on you start screaming in tongues. Unless it's really God, that would be inappropriate. Amen? Yeah. Can we agree? Like, that's, that's not being spiritual. That's being maybe weird, right? And you're not just supposed to stand up and start yelling, thus saith the Lord. But when this flame, flame lands upon you, you can all of a sudden see the angels instead of the dirty laundry in people. Wow. And you can start speaking words of encouragement or get creative ideas. You could be that source of the life of God in your office in your classroom, in your family, in your friendships. All of a sudden, you're no longer trapped in the grave. The flame of God has landed upon you. And the fire of God lands on your life. Shaba. 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 You see the two ladies right here? She's like, look, there's something on your head. Look, there's something on your head. It's the flame of God. Look. It's upon you. And some of you are just the lady in the back just celebrating with everybody. Some of you like this old guy saying, I don't have much hair left. Don't burn it up. I need that hair. Some of you are like this lady, like I'm, I'm scared to tell people what I see, but I need to tell my husband I'm seeing something. I'm prophesying husbands right there. I don't know if you know that. That's, that's what that was right there. We need this. Amen? And, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not yelling. I'm not hyping this up because this doesn't, like, it, it's supposed to affect your emotions, but I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm talking we need the flame of God in our lives. <laughs> Come on. Because when that flame lands upon you, Kelly, we start thinking better thoughts. I, I don't, I'm studying this. I don't have time to teach it today. I feel by the Lord I'm supposed to. Because the enemy attacks you in your thoughts. He don't come in and drop pornography in your house and drop doubt in your house. And That's not the devil. It starts right here. That's what he did to Eve. Just ask some questions. Can you really trust God? And that's what all your doubts really come back to. Can you really trust God? And when that flame of God lands in your life, you now have the Spirit of Christ in you. You can speak forth truth even when you don't feel it. But this flame of God answers these questions. Who are you? Who are you? Let me tell you. You're a blood-bought child of the living God. You, this is who you are. You are loved. You are safe in your Father's arms. You are cared for. You are not alone. You are not an orphan. But the spirit of adoption rests upon you. You are, you are loved. You are celebrated. You are valuable. Where are you from? You're from the heart of God. You were born in the heart of God. You're here because God wants you here. God is everlasting. You're not. You're created. And you were created on purpose. You're not everlasting, you're a created being, and you're created on purpose. God could have chosen not to, but he chose to. He chose to create you because he loves you. You're from his heart, and one day you will spend eternity with him. And this all begs the question, how do you talk? You talk like somebody who sees the angels. You talk like someone who has a flame on their head and looks for the flame on other people's heads. 
You speak life into every situation. You have the ability to control your words. You have the ability to control your heart. You have the ability to control your thoughts. You have the ability to control your situation because you talk as one who gives life. People want to hear from you because wherever you go, your words bring life. And this is his expectation with Pentecost. I experience life and I share it with the world. Say that with me. I experience life and I share it with the world. One more time. I experience life and I share it with the world. Pentecost is the encounter with God where the language of God is imprinted on your heart. I might get my musician to come up. Pentecost is the encounter with God where the language of God is imprinted on your heart. And this isn't just for the super spiritual people. This isn't just for the flopping on the ground people. Though, let me say this. You should all flop at least once. You should all flop at least once. But this isn't, it isn't just, it isn't just for the super spiritual this is a, God's creating a prophetic people who have a positive influence on every sphere of influence they're in. Let me close with this one last scripture that is so often misinterpreted out of the book of Revelation. Go ahead and put it up. Revelation 2.15. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Now, there is a false theology of the end times that says he's making all new things. He's not making all new things. He's not replacing anything. He's not making all new things. He's making all things new. I bought a house. He's not taking it from me. But he's making all things new. By his spirit, by his spirit, he is... Watch this. Restoring all things. By His Spirit, He is restoring all things. And I'm believing in your life, He's going to make all things new by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you. Can you say amen? Stand with me if you would. Shaba. Now I need you to be, you can play whatever you want, Mike, but I need you to be in the spirit of here I am. That prophetic flow that God and man come and encounter one another. And I'm going to pray. Huh. I'm going to pray for you now. And there's two things I want to pray for. I want to pray that you would experience that tongue of fire upon your life. I want you to value it. I want you. And when that tongue touches you, when that flame touches you, Travis, all things are new. If you're a guest today, I just welcome you. That's so awesome that you got to be here when the Spirit is moving. This is so good. But I want to pray right now for everybody that, that, that you would be aware of that flame, number one. And number two, you would allow it to affect how you speak. I got like nine messages in this series already mapped out. I am pretty excited about what God is doing through this message series. I got a spreadsheet. It just keeps growing with messages on spiritual revival. We're just going to sit in revival for a little bit. Is that okay? Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus. Wow. If you feel like that's, that's me, I need this. I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. If, if, yeah. And I believe the Lord wants to touch some people today. And I want to pray with you that these things begin to manifest in your life. I'm sure you'll help me line up some folks. And I'm just going to, I'm going to quickly, I'm not expecting you to fly through the air, but I'm not expecting you to not to either. And I'm just going to begin praying. Let's, let me just pray for everybody. The Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you bring divine... Wow. Divine appointments with people who need words of life. Who need the fruit of that tongue of fire.
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to begin praying. Come on, can you give it up for the Word of God this morning? Oh, we're so, so thankful, Jesus, for what you're doing, what you're doing in your people, what you're doing on the earth today. And uh, something, something I used to say a lot is I want to be right in the middle of whatever you're doing on the earth, Jesus. I want to be right in the middle of whatever you're doing on the earth. And I want to let you know today that God is doing something right here. He's doing something in your life today. He's doing something in your family today. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, can you say amen? amen? Hey, happy Father's Day. We have donuts out there for the dads. And uh, we're going to stay here. If you want some prayer, continue to line up. God is moving over here. Ha. Huh? If you are in the room and, and you're not receiving prayer, just stretch your hands forward and pray for the people who are, for, are up here now. But, hey, I bless you. I dismiss you to have an amazing day, an amazing week. Go have a donut on your way out. And also, I think there's a photo booth somewhere where you can take pictures for Father's Day. But I might be wrong about that. I'm not 100% sure. Ah. God bless you guys. Have an amazing Sunday. We'll see you next week. Come to Burning Room, 730 on Friday nights. We'll see you.